Several years ago, uh, the first time I had ever gone to Guatemala, I've been to Guatemala quite a few times, but the first time I ever went, um, I made the mistake I make most of the time I travel, and that is uh, I forgot to take any sunglasses. And when you're that much closer to the equator and all the things, the, the light's just bright. I usually have glasses on, but if I'm sweating that bad, I'm going to have a contact in. Like, man, I wish I had some sunglasses. But we went to the market, and I bought a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses. <laughs> right? Ray-Ban sunglasses. They were barely even sunglasses. They were so thin that I thought, there's no way these won't break today. Like, it's the, the cheapest plastic I'd ever felt. Um, and the, the glass was like, I don't know if there was, I don't know what they dipped it in to, to get it. But it was like not even easy to see through the cheapest things, whatever. But I, I, I came home with them and they've been somewhere, I don't even remember where, maybe in a drawer at, at home. And so fast forward, I've, I've had them for years. Garrett needed to borrow some sunglasses for something he was going to go do. Um, this has been more than a year ago. Hey, I need to borrow some sunglasses. And I said, here, you can borrow these. Because I'm not going to give him anything I ever want back. <laughs> if you don't know my oldest son, I, I say this lovingly. He's not here to defend himself today. But Garrett, if you're watching, let's be honest. He's either going to keep it or break it. Like those are the two options, right? But what's not going to happen is that it's not going to make its way back to me. And fast forward, he'd had those glasses for quite a while. And randomly, kind of out of nowhere, he went, I can't believe you're letting me use a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses. <laughs> and I started to just laugh. Like, not like in his face, but in his face. And I said, I would never give you a pair of real Ray-Bans that I ever wanted back. You've just kind of demonstrated that. No offense, I'm, I'm not being ugly or hateful. And he was like, well, I assumed, because he knows himself, right? And so I told him the story. I paid literally a couple dollars U.S. for those glasses. When we were coming up to Daniel chapter 2, I texted Garrett and said, hey, can I, can I get those Ray-Bans from you? Are, are they, do you have them at college with you in Florida, or are they here in the house somewhere? He replies with, oh, I lost those a long time ago. <laughs> And I thought, how fitting. Like, the only thing better than me showing you those glasses today is telling you that we don't know where they are. <laughs> the point is, sometimes it's not quite as easy to tell what is counterfeit and what is real. Sometimes the counterfeit is so close to real that we can find ourselves deceived for a long time. And this morning's text helps us clarify between a counterfeit kingdom and the kingdom of God. For everything that God's ever created, we believe that the enemy's tried to create a counterfeit that he can sell us on that will never live up to what it promises. This morning, we're gonna distinguish between the kingdom of God and a counterfeit kingdom. We're gonna do that by looking at the same thing we did last week, and that is the two perspectives. There's history, and then there's the story of God. Now, I was thinking about that this week, these two perspectives, and maybe this won't make as much sense to your brain as it did to mine, the idea of this is historically what happened and the idea of this is what God was up to is kind of like the difference between what and so what. Because sometimes you hear the story and you're like, okay, that's the what, but so what? See, history is the what and the story of God is the so what. And we're going to see both the what and the so what in the text this morning. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So please quickly, uh, quickly grab your Bibles if you would. If you don't have one, there's one underneath the seat in front of you. And we're going to hold up our Bibles and say a creed about what we believe this book to be this morning. Here we go. The Bible is the word of God. The truth of the Bible will change my life. Lord, open my heart and awaken my mind and give me grace to respond. Change me for your glory and my joy. Amen. Please turn to, to Daniel chapter 2. The book of Daniel chapter number 2. If you're using one of those Bibles from the seat in front of you, it's page 690, 690. It'll also be on the screen. There is a lot of ground to cover. You might notice that there are 49 verses in this chapter. We are not going to read all of them, but we are going to read most of them. I'll read fast if you'll listen fast. Is that a good deal? Verse number one, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep 
left him. We can almost call these kind of nightmares. Dreams that troubled him so bad he could not sleep. Then the king commanded, and I want you to notice this list. This is important. The king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. This list is the who's who of the most trustworthy men in this kingdom. When it says magicians, I tend to picture like a guy pulling a rabbit out of a hat. You know, he's wearing white gloves maybe or whatever. But people smarter than me say that's probably not what is meant in this historical context of magicians. This would actually be like the, the scholarly people in the room. Maybe uh, in our context, this is more like the professor than the magician. But it's the scholars. It's the people who understand the sacred texts from all the different religions represented in the Babylonian Empire. Then we have the enchanters. We might would call these uh, folks astrologers. They're a, a group of priests that in the New Testament are called magi. They study the stars and the planets and the, the sky in order to tell the future. Then we have the sorcerers, and that probably is what you're picturing. They would have herbs and charms and potions to help them tell the future. There's special books that they would chant from. And then we have the Chaldeans, which is just an ethnic group. Um, and so what we think this is referring to in the text is specifically the group, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is a Chaldean. It, it would be the, the who's who of his people. This would be his advisory council. This is the cabinet, right? Um, this, this is his, his royal court. And so what we have here is we have a crystal ball with a rabbit's foot and a horoscope and a fortune cookie with a fortune teller and a palm reader and a psychic, like all wrapped up in one advisory board, okay? And the reason that's so important is this is the best of man's counsel available in this moment. This is the best, the smartest, the brightest of the bright. These are all the best sellers from the New Age bookstore. <laughs> that's important, we'll need to remember that in a minute. Verse three, the king said to them, I had a dream. And my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Again, context historically, when the king is troubled, usually he's going to trouble other people, right? That's not bad news for the king. That's bad news for everybody, right? Some of you are like, I know, have you met my husband? I mean, when he's in a bad mood, it's gonna get... no, this is way worse, right? <laughs> my wife laughed way too hard at that joke. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, that's your language, O king, live forever, you grumpy man. Tell your servants the dream, and we'll show you the interpretation. Scholars say there was actually a little book. It was like a key, right? Where if he mentions a cow, this is what a cow means. If he mentions a bird, this is what a bird means. If he's in his underwear giving a decree, presentation, you know, that means this. That means he had mushroom pizza before he went to bed. Whatever. Everything had an easy explanation. So the way this worked is, is you would tell your dream to this group of people. They would look it up and go, oh, this means whatever. That's important to know because the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word for me is firm. If you don't make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you'll be torn limb from limb and your houses, your ancestry, your family will be laid to ruins. Listen, you think your boss is grumpy when he gives you a deadline? We will tear you limb from limb and burn your house down. Yes, sir. Not just that you would tell me the interpretation. You have to tell me the dream first, right? Here's what this is. This is, are you mad about something? If you loved me, you'd know. <laughs> That's what this is, right? Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, Lord help us. Okay, no. If you knew, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Okay. Verse number six, so that's him using negative reinforcement. <laughs> now he's going to try positive reinforcement. If you show the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. Verse seven, they answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. I don't think you know how this works, king. 
In verse 8, the king said, I know with certainty you're trying to gain time. You see the word from me is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time change. Therefore, tell me the dream. And I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. This is, remember, who's speaking here? The who's who of intellectual property on planet Earth. Right? The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. What they're saying is you are asking something that is above our pay grade and we're the highest pay grade there is. And so that's the history. That's the what. Let me pause for just a minute and tell you the first so what. I just want to declare this morning, our God is the God of the impossible. When it is impossible with man, our God doesn't break a sweat. And maybe you're walking in here facing something and you've talked to the brightest people you know. You've even Googled, how do I fix my problem? And you've read the best articles with the highest reviews on Google reviews. And you still can't find a way out of your situation. And I just want to tell you, with confidence and authority this morning, our God is the God of the impossible. When no one else has an answer, our God is still on the throne. The cream of the occultic cult is standing before the king going, we got nothing. We, we, have, we are certified in dream interpretation. But in our certification process, nobody taught us how to figure out what the dream was. This is impossible. And I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Spoiler alert, God shows off. The best of the best says this is impossible. Verse 12, because of this, because his best plans and advisors failed him, the king was angry and very furious. Man, when our plans don't work, isn't it just infuriating? He commanded that all the wise, all, all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed limb from rim, limb, limb from limb, house laid in ruins. So this includes our friend Daniel from last week who we met. By the way, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel and walk through chapter one with us. But that means Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they're also under this death sentence. And I'll be honest with you, I've known this story since I was a kid. And I don't think I realized how bad it had escalated. Now, maybe my Sunday school teacher didn't start off with, hey, kids, let's talk about sudden death. I don't know. I just did not, I don't think I remembered this literally was a death sentence. The decree went out. The wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. I've never had a day that bad. Verse 14, and Daniel replied with prudence and discretion. Had I ever had a day that bad, I don't think I would reply with prudence and discretion. I think I would hope I could outrun the person next to me. But he replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who'd gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is this decree, why is the decree of the king so urgent? What happened? I'm just sitting here eating my fruit and fruit. I don't think he had vegetables for breakfast. Did, did anybody get that? Okay. Go watch this sermon from last week. Okay. Arioch made known the matter known to, to Daniel. He, he told him, here's what's going on. Verse 16, Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. It's pretty bold. Verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven 
concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Verse 19, then this mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And the only possible response when you seek mercy from the God of heaven and he grants it is this, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. I want you to know Daniel didn't go, ha, I got this. He said, no, if I have wisdom, it's because it belongs to you. If I have insight, it's because it belongs to you. So I bless your name. This God changes times and seasons, let alone removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise if they have any wisdom. He gives knowledge to those who have understanding if they actually have any understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells in him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you've given me wisdom and might. And have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you've made known to us the king's matter. The first so what is we serve the God of the impossible. And the second so what is our God is also the God of the supernatural. We serve a God who performs miracles and wonders for his name's sake and for his glory. He answers this prayer through a supernatural vision. One of the ways that God distinguishes his kingdom from all the other fake counterfeit kingdoms is we serve the God of the supernatural. Some of you have experienced things that doctors couldn't explain, that science can't make sense of. The apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And still today around the world, we're seeing God use supernatural dreams and visions to bring people to saving faith. That makes Americans uncomfortable. We have such access to the word. And we have such access to the preaching of the word that we don't see much of that in our context. And when we do see it, it seems pretty fake and abusive, right? Even though they have private jets. And we're like, mm, skeptic, right? You're right to be skeptical. However, there are conservative evangelical missionaries serving in Muslim contexts who don't believe that God speaks through signs and visions who are leading Muslims to Christ by the truckload who are like, I had a dream. I saw Jesus. I can't shake it. I want to give my life to Jesus. The underground church in the Middle East is exploding from people who first heard the gospel in a vision. We serve the God of the supernatural. By the way, it's the same story with underground church in China. Some of us have heard those testimonies together of people who first encountered Jesus in a vision. There's nothing in the Bible that says God has stopped to be the God of the miraculous. There's this Christian teaching that has pushed back against the things that seem to abuse this, but an opposite extreme is not a healthy balance. I don't believe God had a light switch in his authority to do the miraculous and he flipped it off one day. I believe in the supernatural. I believe in supernatural healing. I'm really skeptical of a person who goes, I'm a healer, give me your money. But I believe in a God who heals. I've watched it. I believe in a God who reveals himself. Now, I believe in the authority of God's word, and so any of my experiences must submit to the authority of God's word, must be tested by the authority of God's word. Because when I experience something that seems uh, supernatural, like a vision, if I have a vision, that vision could come from one of three places. It could come from the God of heaven, or it could come from the enemy, or it can come from my own imagination. And so I'm supposed to test that to see whether it passes the test of truth. We don't chase signs and wonders, but we do submit to the God of the supernatural. So what? Our God is the God of the impossible. And our God is the God 
of the supernatural. Here's so what number three. If he's the God of the impossible and the God of the supernatural, then that explains why prayer works. Our God hears and answers the prayers of his people. The reason we believe in the power of prayer is because we believe in the power of God. He loves us enough to care. He loves us enough to lean in and listen and then to respond. That is a glorious God. And this is the first time in the story of Daniel we get this kind of glimpse into the priority of prayer in his life. In chapter 6, we're going to see that he prayed three times a day. Did so even publicly at uh, getting in trouble for that. In chapter 9, we have a really long prayer from Daniel. But this is what I love. One pastor, and again, I, I, I keep giving credit where credit's due. Um, Skip Heitzig and J.D. Greer were so helpful this week to to see this text pastorally, but one of them, and I forget which one I read, said, prayer was their first priority, not their last resort. Okay. Prayer was their first priority, not their last resort. And so many of us, when we face the impossible and we need some supernatural, we try everything else that doesn't work, and then we go, I guess there's nothing left to do but pray. And prayer was their first response. Every week we talk here about text pray FW to 94000. And here's the thing, a lot of you don't. Matter of fact, sometimes we find out from your loved ones about something that you're facing because you, you didn't text that to us. And I don't say that to, to like shame you or embarrass you, whatever, I, I get it. Some of you are like, this wasn't important enough to pray for. Huh. Okay. I don't know if that means you see yourself as not important to God or if you think God's too distracted by you or maybe we've not demonstrated that we care about what's a big deal to you. But please just hear me. There's never been such a thing as this is too small for God or too big for God. He loves you. He cares. And he's listening. And we believe prayer moves his heart. How does that work? I don't know. (laughs) How does a God who has decided everything have his heart changed? I don't know, but prayer works. And, and we remind you of text, pray FW to 94000. We say that every week just to remind you that in this house, we believe in the power of prayer. One person's excited about that. Praise God. Our God is the God of the impossible. Our God is the God of the supernatural. And our God hears and answers the prayers of his people. And here's the fourth so what. God gives us each other. Like our God's not just revealing who he is, seated on the throne of the universe. He's also saying, I've given you a people. In the meantime, while you're dwelling in the midst of Babylon, you've got a people. When Daniel hears your life is under threat, you know what he did? He went to his community group. This is where I'm going to pitch community groups again. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Daniel was living in community before the crisis. Daniel didn't have a crisis and then go look to create community. He was already living in community. Somebody needs to hear this from my heart. Community groups are most needed when they seem least necessary. I'm going to say that again. Community groups are most needed when they seem least necessary. Life's fine. I got plenty of friends. There's other people who pray for me. Listen, I'm just telling you, when you find yourself in the midst of crisis, you're going to want to know that there's some people shoulder to shoulder fighting against whatever that thing is that you're facing. When we build those relationships, I saw in an article this week from Axis, I was reminded of this quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what, you too? And when we sit in a circle and discuss scripture and pray for one another, what we're experiencing is, oh, there's a lot of you twos. Or yous too? I don't know what the grammar would be there. But all y'all, we're facing the same stuff. And we're just sitting in a circle discussing Sunday sermon. I, I, I uh, I heard Tom, Mess, uh, Tom Mercer say this this week. Tom Mercer is an incredible man of God. I had, had the privilege of speaking with him this week in California at an event. And just off the cuff, he said about 
sitting in a circle and discussing Sunday's text. He said, every presentation deserves a conversation. Every presentation deserves a conversation. If we're going to present God's word, let's talk about it and think about it. Not just observe it and maybe absorb a little bit of it and then go home. Let's have a conversation. God gives us each other. Skip down to verse number 26. So Daniel hears from God. He gets an appointment with the king. Verse 26, the king king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I've seen and its interpretation? Now, it's a great question, right? The king's like, so do I have to kill you today or are you going to do your job, right? Good question. Daniel's response is so incredible because what's the answer? Yes, sir, right? His answer is yes. You with me? That's not his answer. Look at verse 27. Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, no enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery the king has asked. I love before he says yes, he says, let's just be real clear about this. None of your best solutions of man have worked. Like, let, let's just sit there for a minute at that courage. Daniel's like, before I ask your question, let me tell you about your situation. You've got the best solutions of man. And they can't show you this. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. In the middle of our summer series through some of the but God texts in scripture, Neil preached this passage. And so we won't park here very long. But in this context, I just want you to see when when human strategies fail, when all of the best resources available to us come up short, they got nothing. But there is a God in heaven. And that idea of but God doesn't change our problems, but it sure can change our perspective of our problems. Maybe we've tried everything we could do to fix the marriage and it's not worked, but there is a God in heaven. We've tried everything we could to help our kid get on the right path, but there is a God in heaven. We've tried everything to overcome that addiction, but there's a God in heaven. We got that phone call about that health issue and it seems so overwhelming, but there is a God in heaven. Maybe we've lost a loved one and death just seems so final. And I just want you to hear today, but there is a God in heaven. Maybe we're disappointed with the political machine that we live in, but there is a God in heaven. And maybe we're disappointed with ourselves this morning, but there is a God in heaven. Daniel, in this moment, did not try to perform his way out. That idea that we've dumbed this book down to be a good boy like Daniel, be brave like Daniel, be courageous like Daniel. Daniel didn't trust his strength. Daniel didn't trust his courage. Daniel didn't trust himself. Daniel sought the God of heaven. But there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream. The visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. Verse 29. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. He who reveals mysteries has made known to you what is to be. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your mind. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. Think of a giant statue. Think of a big idol. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. And it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces. They became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and a wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone 
that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. He gives some description about what these things were. We'll we'll circle back in a minute, but skip down to verse 44 because I don't want to miss the point of that. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. That's the stone, that's the mountain, that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. That's the what. So what? Our God's kingdom will never end, and it is coming soon. That's so what. Our God's kingdom will never end, and is coming soon. Just some more context about the what. I just couldn't wait on the so what. (laughs) Skip Heitzig pointed out, he said it's interesting to him that the image in his dream that God would give this unbeliever was of a statue. He said, I find it just fascinating for three reasons. He said, number one, at this time historically, Babylon was the capital of idolatry. Like it was the, if you looked at the little tag on the idol, it would have said made in Babylon. Okay. Okay. And here's the beauty. We serve a God who reveals truth in our language. We have a God who reveals truth in words that we can understand. How merciful, how kind that he would show him a giant image. He said, number two, it's interesting that God reveals an image of man. Because that is the contrast between the counterfeit and the real deal is the kingdom of men versus the kingdom of God. And here's the thing about kingdoms of men. They will always be unstable. I don't believe that Daniel had any concept of Newton's universal law of gravity. I don't think he was doing science when he saw this vision. But it's fascinating. Science tells us that the specific gravity of gold is 19 The specific gravity of silver is 11. The specific gravity of bronze is 8.5. Iron is 7.8. And the specific gravity of clay is 2. Science helps us understand this thing was pretty top-heavy, which is true of all of our best efforts. They are unstable at best. So look look back again at, at our text here. The head of the image was of fine gold. Daniel explained to him, this is you, King Nebuchadnezzar. This is your kingdom. Representing the Babylonian Empire from 626 B.C. till somewhere around 539 B.C., the Babylonian Empire was the world's first great superpower. It was unlike anything human history has recorded prior. Nebuchadnezzar, this is hard for me to wrap my, my mind around. You construction guys can try to picture the, the absurdity of what I'm about to say. Nebuchadnezzar built a wall around Babylon that was stretched for 56 miles and in places was over 80 feet thick. Like eight stories thick and 300 feet tall. 30-story skyscraper. That's the walls. (laughs) And then it's said that this city was covered in gold. It was called the city of gold. If it wasn't covered in gold, it was accented in gold. About 90 years later, a historian named Herodotus visited Babylon. And he said, this city has more gold than any city I've ever seen in my life. And he said this. Gold oozed out of every pore of Babylon. It was the golden city. Then we have the chest and the arms made of silver. Two body parts that combine in one. We believe that is Media from the north and Persia from the east. The Medo-Persian Empire. 
which overthrew Babylon in 539 B.C., which we'll read about in uh, Daniel chapter 5. Then the belly and the thighs are made of bronze. And we stop getting specific information in the text about what this was prophesying about. But we have the privilege of living on this side of the prophecy. And we believe, most scholars believe, that this represents Greece. Alexander the Great, the superpower that conquered the Medo-Persian Empire around 220 B.C. Interestingly, historians tell us that Alexander the Great was one of the first ever to pioneer the use of bronze in his weaponry. They wore bronze helmets, shields, carried bronze swords. The chariots were made of bronze. And it was called, by secular historians, the kingdom of bronze. Pause, parenthesis. I just find this interesting. Uh, If you've been around church for a long time, perhaps you've heard of a historian named Josephus. Josephus, a Jewish historian, tells us a story that when Alexander the Great was conquering Jerusalem, a high priest named Jadua came out and approached Alexander the Great and read from the scroll of Daniel, this prophecy. And according to Josephus, Alexander the Great got off his horse and got down on his knees and paid homage to the God of the Jews. That doesn't really mean anything for this morning. I just find that interesting. Next are these legs made of iron. Most scholars believe this represents Rome, the kingdom that conquered Greece in 63 BC. Iron is the strongest of all these metals, which maybe was a prophecy of how strong Rome would be. Rome definitely took military strength and dominance to a whole new level historically. The legs are also the longest part of the image in the prophecy, and Rome definitely had the longest era of ruling the world. Babylon's rule lasted around 70 years. Um, The Medo-Persian and Greek empires were about 200 years each, but the Roman Empire would last for 500 years in the west and more than 1,500 years in the east, so maybe his legs should have been a little lopsided. But that's, we believe that's the Roman Empire which is incredibly relevant today, and I have no idea why. But one of the top trending things on TikTok this week was hashtag Roman Empire. TikTok is a social media app if you're under the age of 40, if you're over the age of 40. 1.2 billion views on TikTok for hashtag Roman Empire, where you're supposed to ask someone, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And then you post the answer. Because we apparently have nothing else to do. But if you want to be a part of the trend, you can now say, we talked about it today at our church. You should come to temple. Anyway. (laughs) The rock is none other than Jesus himself establishing the kingdom of God. We testify this morning that there is no rock like our God, that language is all throughout the scriptures, that Jesus has come to destroy every false kingdom that mankind has done their best to build. And one day will come and will tangibly and visibly establish his kingdom that will rule the world. So what's interesting, here's where we we walk the bridge between the what and the so what. Everything in that statue has already been fulfilled. And if all that happened, (laughs) then we could take it to the bank that he's coming again. If all of that has been fulfilled, we talked about this last week, all that's been fulfilled in such a way that people who try really hard to dis prove the Bible. They can't stand the book of Daniel. Like, how did he get all this right? If all of that has proven trustworthy, then the fact that 
One day he will make right everything that is so wrong. It's trustworthy too. Here's the response. Verse 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. He fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel. He commanded that an offering, an incense be offered to him. And the king answered and said to Daniel, I want you to hear this. He did not say, Daniel, you are the man. He said, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. (gasps) This guy who thought he was a god fell on his face and said, truly your God is the God of all gods. Oh. He's a revealer of mysteries. You've been able to reveal this mystery. And the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him a ruler over the whole province of Babylon, chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request to the king. He appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. David remained in the king's court. And and this is the last thing I I, want to point out, this bridge between the what and the so what. Our God has called us, appointed us to represent his kingdom well while we're still living in Babylon. If it's true that he's the God of the impossible, If it's true that he's the God of the supernatural and that he hears and responds to the prayers of his people and he gives us one another in the meantime and eventually he's going to make right everything that's wrong, if all that's true, then he's left us here in this moment and in this season so that even rulers might see in us that there is a God above every God. Now, we might not get a promotion like this. (laughs) We might not get riches and honor, but that we would at least be distinct in the eyes of Babylon. Daniel was a part of the first wave or first phase of exiles brought to Babylon. If you remember last week, they were supposed to bring the best of the best, right? About 10 years later, they would bring everybody else. And during that 10 years of in-between time, a whole bunch of false prophets came up and they were telling everybody, here's how we got to deal with Babylon. We got to just pray against it. We got to reject it. We got to resist it. We got to stay so separate that we make no difference there. And a lot of times, J.D. Greer said this, He said, a lot of times Christians think our only options in the culture are extreme separation or extreme assimilation. (laughs) Like a lot of times we think our only option is to be so removed we make no difference or so integrated we make no difference. But during this season, God raised up a true prophet named Jeremiah. And he said that God's will for his people in that moment was to infiltrate Babylon and influence it for the kingdom of God. He wrote a letter to those exiles. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, we read this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give them... Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Don't de- decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. In its welfare, you'll find your welfare. And here's what J.D. Greer said. We are not called to separation or assimilation. We are called to transformation. That's the calling of God's people. We're not so removed that we can't make a difference or so integrated that we can't make a difference. We are shining as a light in the midst of Babylon saying, our God is the God of the impossible. Our God is the God of the supernatural. He listens to his people and responds. He gives us a community of faith and his kingdom will reign forever. In a world full of counterfeits, this 
is the real deal. The eternal God is your dwelling place. And underneath are the everlasting arms. And so as you leave here today, you're all going to get a real pair of Ray-Bans. Independent fact checkers uh, have proven that to be false. Uh, That's not true. Uh, You're not. No, you're going to walk out here with something way more real than that. That's going to serve you way better than a pair of sunglasses. And that is maybe a set of lenses that sees all of life in the midst of Babylon. Through the hope that our God is the God of the impossible. And he's the God of the supernatural when every other plan has failed. We still have a God who hears and answers the prayers of his people. He gives us one another and he is coming again. So may we step out these doors and represent him well in Babylon this week. I doubt your boss is gonna fall down at your feet and worship God. If that happens, please take out your phone and record that. It will make a great sermon illustration for next week. It'll probably be a little more subtle than that. But no less profound and no less life-changing for somebody. Here's the thing about Babylon. The best hope available left the king with no answers. And in a world starving for a glimpse of hope, God's sending you out today.